Welcome to Stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw. I would be Bradshaw, and that would be the Oklahoma legend, the greatest thing to ever come out of Oklahoma, and the WWE Hall of Famer, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And when you talk about the greatest tag teams of all time, I don't think anybody in the early 2000s would think that the Road Warriors would have competition to be the GOAT. But this man and his tag team partner, they did it. Based upon the territories they ran, the titles that they held, Ron Simmons and I had some great times in WWE. We remember most of them. The ones we don't remember were with these guys because we love them, and he's Bubba Dudley. Bubba, welcome to the show. Guys, thank you very much for having me. I'm genuinely happy to be on, on with you guys and speaking to the both of you. I have mad respect for the both of you, and you know that, so... Absolute pleasure. Well, Bob, 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 I'm sorry, John. Bob, I'd like to add my thanks for you being on the show. We ran into each other a couple of weeks back. Didn't really have a lot of time to talk to each other, but we didn't need it because we're friends and we know how each other feels about each other. But I'm honored to be on this show. I mean, I'm in great company. I'm in, I'm in the company of two more Hall of Famers, man. And, you know, it's not <laughs> often that, uh, that this show, we get, we get the quality of, of character you are. I so much enjoy your, your, your podcast and what you can do. You kind of are similar to what John and I try to do. You know, there's so much negative BS out there. Why, why, why throw uh, gas on a fire? I mean, you know, there's, uh, let the world have some positive attitudes. And, you know, for Bully Ray Dudley, you get on there and you bring a positive uh, take to, to what's going on in our business. Sometimes it's hard to do, I know, but... But you you find the positive things in there. We so much appreciate it because that's kind of our format too. That to, you know, there's too much good out there to dwell on the negative. So these kids nowadays, they're fantastic in what they do. Is it the same thing we did? Hell no. Do we like everything they did? No. Did you like everything you did back in the old days? Hell no. So you know, let's just forget about those things and dwell on the positive. So welcome to uh, Briscoe and Bradshaw's talk show here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. And yes, uh, we try to keep things as positive as possible on Busted Open. Busted Open. It's it's turned into a pro wrestling radio, sh- uh, you know, radio show to like a morning show that also talks about pro wrestling. And uh, we're very proud of what we've been able to do and how we kind of bring the wrestling universe together. We talk about every company out there, whether it's the WWE or AEW, Impact, Ring of Honor, New Japan. We try to highlight all of the positives first. And then what I like to do, and as the both of you know that I'm brutally honest, um, sometimes entirely too honest, and my mouth and my honesty has gotten me in trouble, but, but so be it. Just try to be honest about the wrestling business and not lie to everybody like unfortunately happens way too often in our industry. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. We're, and we're having a good time doing it. Well, Bubba, you're now yeah. like uh, Hogan, San Martino, Rock, and Stone Cold all ro- rolled into one with Busted Open. I mean, what what the hell happened? Wow. I mean, you guys started doing this show. It was great. It was right there by Fox News. I came over there a few times and, and said hi to you, did your show a couple of times. And all of a sudden, you guys just exploded. You're number one on everything now, right? We're the number one sports show on the entire SiriusXM platform. We're outperforming the NFL. We're outperforming Major League Baseball, which is, which is, it's, it's really crazy when you think about it. A, a professional wrestling talk show that airs live every day for three hours is doing bigger numbers than the NFL is doing bigger numbers in major league baseball. And now we're number one in pod in pro wrestling podcasts. So, I mean, we're very blessed. We have a great fan base, the busted open nation. They tune in every single morning and they, and they stick around for three hours with us. I mean, think about listening to three hours of radio at one time. I mean, sometimes it's hard enough just to watch three hours of TV, let alone listen, you know, to three hours of radio, but they do it. They're very dedicated. You know, pro wrestling fans, they're like junkies. They always have been. That's why Vince invented the network because he knew that 24-7, you can, you, you can have wrestling fans who want to consume uh, any one particular product. And that's what we do. It's, it's every day. And our fan base is lo- very, very loyal to us. You know, it's insane that you're in better, you're bigger than the NFL during the NFL because nothing else in the world is close to the NFL. You know, people talk about how soccer, football worldwide is such a, a huge sport, and it is. There's no taking away from that. But the leagues across the, the pond 
don't compare to the NFL as far as revenue. They're that far ahead of everybody else. And for you to be ahead of the NFL as far as all the shows that are on there, what do you think to attribute the success to? Because there's a lot of shows out there that are doing wrestling. What is different about yours? I think it's, first of all, it's the fan base. Because wrestling fans, as we all know, want to talk pro wrestling 24-7. And now they have a place where they can listen to um, Hall of Famers like myself and Mark Henry. Listen to Dave LaGreca, the guy that who invented the show 12 years ago. He's the uber fan. He's the voice of the wrestling fan. And the two guys that started the show were Dave LaGreca and Doug Mortman. Two fans who just talked about wrestling all the time. And as a pro, I was always a fan of their show because they respected the business. If they talked negatively about someone or something, they always did it with respect, just giving their opinion. And I was a guest on their show several times. And I just remember one time talking to Dave and I said, have you ever thought about taking the show to the next level? And he's like, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, on, on ESPN, there are those shows like, uh, I guess it's like first take or, you know, it's like Shannon Sharp and um, um, Bayless. Yeah, Bayless. Skip Bayless. Bayless or before that, it was uh, Stephen A. Smith and Skip Bayless. That constant kind of animosity between two. I said, pro wrestling deals us animosity all the time. What if we were to talk about it from the professional point of view and the fans point of view and bring that all together? Point, counterpoint, discuss, argue, poke fun at. And it, and it took off. And, you know, we threw Mark Henry in there. We threw Tommy Dreamer in there. And there's just a nice mix uh, of, you know, um, takes, opinions, point of views. And wrestling fans just dig it so much. And they get to call us every day. I mean, wrestling fans just get to pick up the phone. I get to talk to Bubba. I get to talk to Mark Henry. I get to talk to Tommy Dreamer. You know, I get to interact. They'll ask questions to the talent that comes on our show. So when you can bring wrestling fans into our world the way we do, I think that really speaks to the success of the product. You know what I think I'm gonna do right now to help our show is I'm gonna give out Jerry Briscoe's home telephone number. <laughs> and that way, listen, any fans out there, you can call him 24 seven, it doesn't matter. Whatever you need, call Gerald Briscoe. He'll answer the phone and answer all your questions. <laughs> If I can figure out how to hit the hit the, hit the call button there, Bubba, <laughs> let me tell you, let me tell you what my friend did. Be on back in the days when APA was hot and everything, and uh, and we were all we were all 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 there during the Attitude Era. I would, I, you know, I would I'd wear that Briscoe Brothers Body Shop uh, telephone uh, T-shirt with the telephone number on there. Well, JBL, he took it a step forward. When he'd go back to Texas, he would he would look in those books. And he would call every retirement home in Texas and give them my number. And I get home on Wednesday morning after TV, Mr. Briscoe, this is so-and-so at the retirement village in Sun City retirement village in Austin, Texas. You're reaching that time of your life. Would you like to consider buying a home? And he gave it out to every damn retirement home and, and the bed. Maybe he was telling me something, you know, 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like something John would do. Yes. That's yeah. a hell of a rip. And, and then, 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 then on a monthly basis, there's three books that come from te Texas monthly, Texas weekly, and Texas yearly. I got every damn one of them. He actually went in his pocket, spent the money. And, and I started getting these uh, subscriptions of these damn Texas monthly, but they had good recipes in the back of that good old Southwest <laughs> food. So I was having Thanksgiving one time, you know, my family's all from Oklahoma and we, we despise Texas. So the magazines are sitting over in the corner. One of the, one of the nieces and nephews crawls over there. Where did, where did you get the Texas book, uncle Gerald? And then all my family's over. What are you doing with all this trash in your house? <laughs> <laughs> Layfield and I, I, I approached Layfield. Of course, he denied it. So I acted like I snuck out of the dressing room and Ron elbowed him. Oh, what's that all about, John? He said, he don't know it, but I, I did it. And I peeked around the corner. You <laughs> saw a bitch I caught you, man. I called him lying right to me. <laughs> he called me red -handed. I've been I've been signing him up for like five year subscriptions to Texas Parks and Wildlife, Texas Monthly, you name it. I've been signing up, getting everything I could to his house, retirement home. <laughs> 
you two are the feud that the wrestling world never knew that it needed. <laughs> well, right. it, was, it was fun. And speaking of fun, you, you got broken into my uh, uh, into this business by another Hall of Famer, a guy that trained probably as many Hall of Famers as anybody in, in the world, John, the great Johnny Rawls. Uh, tell us about that. Did you grow up? Uh, I heard you say one time you grew up wanting to be a wrestler. Who inspired you and who gave you that direction to go to Johnny? Um, the very first time I watched uh, pro wrestling, Mr. Briscoe, was WWF. <clears throat> and I was inspired by Fuji and Saito, the Moondogs, the Samoans, Gorilla and Martel, Cheap J and Jewel Strongbow. I knew from day one that I loved tag team wrestling and that I always wanted to be a tag team wrestler. Because to me, four guys could be more entertaining than two guys. There was so much more action. And I fell in love with it <clears throat> immediately. Um, one of the misconceptions out there is that I, I was trained by Johnny. I would have loved to have been trained hmm. by Johnny. Devon was trained by Johnny. Taz was trained by Johnny. Dreamer was trained by Johnny. Um, I was supposed to be trained by Johnny. And then some guy pulled the wool over my eyes and took my money. It's a very long story that I'm not going to get into now. But I was trained by a guy who had no business training anybody to be a pro wrestler. He was a former enhancement guy back in the day who, who never made a dime for himself. He was an absolute nobody, but he told me everything that I needed to hear as a kid. He told me about all his WWF connections. <clears throat> he told me he wanted to open up a wrestling school five minutes away from my house. And oh, by the way, when he opened up his territory, he was going to make me the first world heavyweight <laughs> champion. And I was going to be on HBO. Well, Take my money. <laughs> You're saying that something on the internet is wrong? <laughs> no. Bubba wasn't so, trained that by anybody who knew what they were doing. No wonder he was so stiff. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah. oh, stop it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you don't want oh, YouTube man. to say anything. <laughs> Woohoo. So yeah, um, I was just, I was trained yeah. the wrong way, Jerry. And yeah. I, I like to say that the business trained me over time. And I was only as good as the guys that I was in the ring with because, and that's how I got better. Just wow. keeping my ears open and trying to listen and learn on the fly because I was trained ass backwards. And that's Great. why me and Devon opened up our wrestling schools uh. because we felt that we needed to give back to the wrestling industry. we I was trained the wrong way and I never wanted to see anybody trained the wrong way in wrestling. I knew that if they came to our school, at least if they spent a year or two with us, they'd have a good foundation, give themselves an opportunity to make a buck in the business, but most of all, have respect for what we do. That's, that's the important part to respect. The 3D Academy, that's over in Orlando now. What, what are, what, how can, the, how can the, the kids get in touch with 3D Academy? Devon runs the school in Orlando. I run the school in Danbury, Connecticut. You can find us on you know, social media, Team 3D Academy on Instagram and on, on Twitter, or you can email us. And you know, we just try to train guys and gals the old school way. And we've been very fortunate to have a lot of successful students come out of the school. Bubba, Bubba, you, you, you just told us you, you were trained in property, but you know, the guy must have given you something that you you put in your head to do it the right way though you know nothing, because you guys nothing nothing well how you wow well you you you're an exceptional person <laughs> and i tell you what because it seems like from the very first time you started you guys were you know it you guys were up there on you know drawing money and making money I spent about four years on the Northeast Independence. I worked with IWCCW, International World Class Championship Wrestling, run by the Savoldis. <clears throat> so I got, to, I got to hang around veterans that I learned some good stuff from. I also learned some bad stuff. One of, Manny Fernandez. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I learned so many good things from Ma Manny in the ring. I also learned a shitload of bad things outside of the ring. <laughs> well, <laughs> he was trained by me. <laughs> Manny, hey, Manny, 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 Manny. Let me cut you off. Man, I worked with Manny in, in Texas. Manny was, there was not a better worker. Manny could go. Manny was a great, great worker. Any he way you out, wanted to go, we could go. That's right. He had some outside of the ring things that probably shouldn't have been emulated, but the stuff in the ring was awesome. 
I was kind of like Manny's young boy for a couple of months. I would drive him <laughs> where he needed to go. Yeah. Um, he, he, there was a snowstorm in New York State where there was probably three feet of snow on the ground, but he made me take him to a bar. Huh. I said, Manny, no bars are going to be open. Lo and behold, shut up, kid. I know what I'm doing. We huh. found a bar that was open, and I just remember waking up in somebody's house the next day. Um on the couch, Manny's sitting at the table and he had a mound of sugar in front of him. <laughs> <laughs> nice way to put it. <laughs> I'm like, Mr. Fernandez, why are you eating so much sugar? <laughs> That's a strange way to eat it. Yeah. <laughs> are you eating it with a straw? <laughs> so, but, but then, Jerry, when we got to ECW, there were so many veterans there, like a Terry Funk or a Bam Bam yeah. Bigelow, that I, you know, I got to really listen to. And that's where I really started to learn. And in, in the four years that we were in ECW, that's where I learned the most. And that's what kind of really prepared me and Devon for, you know, for, you know, eventually getting beat up by Ron and John. <laughs> yeah. we, got, we got beat up first you got beat up second <laughs> I, 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 I gotta hear this before we move forward your your first introduction into the to the dudley brothers would you introduce yourself in an original bubbled way <laughs> i never thought i would become a stuttering prick but that's what i turned into <laughs> you know this guy would come on right over oh, here oh wow awesome <laughs> My name is Boo, 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 Boo. And then my big brother would hit me in the back of the head and I go, My name is Bubba Ray Dudley. Oh, so awesome. I wanted to hear that so bad. Stupid, it's tough ever. But you know what? When you get handed something like that, you try to do the best that you can with it. <clears throat> and there were nine of us, there were nine Dudleys. Yeah. You know, when you didn't know what to do with somebody in ECW, they are Dudley. They Dudley. <laughs> <laughs> but as time went on, I started to realize that me and Devon had a chemistry. Like at first it was me and Devon against each other. And you want to talk about just beating the shit out of one another. Oh my God. Um, and, and we started to form this bond and we had this chemistry. And I remember going to Paul Heyman and I said, you know, I think if you put us together, we might have something. And Paul being the booker that Paul was said, okay, do it. Let's see what happens. And that's it. Uh -huh. It worked. And, and during that time, you, you guys, what about, what about the rest of the guys on the team? Where, I mean, I saw the, some pictures today going through, getting ready for this interview. I mean, there were, there were so many freaking Dudley. Big Dick Dudley. <laughs> Big Dick. Uh, Alex Rizzo, God rest his soul. One of my best friends, he passed away. But the original Dudleys were Dudley Dudley, Little Snot Dudley, Big Dick Dudley, Sign Guy Dudley, the Indian Guy Dances with Dudley, <laughs> one of your descendants, Mr. Briscoe. <laughs> uh, we had uh, Chubby Dudley. He ate himself to death. Uh, <laughs> one of John's descendants. <laughs> yeah. And then there was myself, Bubba Ray Dudley, Devon Dudley, and then Spike Dudley. So um, I, I don't think I left anybody out. I hope I didn't. But uh, yeah, that's what it was. And me and Devon just had that chemistry. You know, the first so, time yeah. I walked out with Ron, you know, we, Ron and I are kind of the same thing. You know, we, we just kind of migrated to each other. I don't know if both football players or what, but, you know, we, we both kind of migrated to each other in the dress. And we, we were best friends. We worked against each other a ton of times when, when Ron first came back into WWE. Uh, we realized right away, when we first walked out together, we go, this is something special. Did you feel that way with Devon when he first walked out with him? Um, I knew me and Devon had something special when we were against each other. There was just a certain chemistry there. And I, I knew that we just couldn't, we couldn't fight each other forever. And the Dudley thing was a very gimmicky gimmick and it only had so many, so much legs. There's only so much you can do with this act. I knew I always wanted to be involved in a tag team. And this is the first guy that I ever truly had chemistry with. That's why I said, hey, try to put us together. And the first night we ever hit that first 3D, which was so ugly, God awful. God bless Spike for taking it, but it worked and it caught on. And Paul just kept sending us back out there. He gave me a live microphone and he said, I don't care what you say. Just make yourself the most hated guy ever. I want them to want to kill you. And we just went, we went so far every night. 
people talk about how the Dudleys almost started riots. And I, I take offense to that. I don't know what they mean by this word, almost. <laughs> we started riots every yeah. single night. People would come over the guardrail. The cops were called. The, the, the riot police with the dogs were called in one night because the riot was so bad. So we, that's what we had to do to make a name for ourselves. And, you know, it kind of worked. You know, very few guys, I say this all the time, have the ability to really be a heel and have the desire to really be a right. heel. You know, a super heel. You know, a lot of guys want to be you, you. <laughs> I didn't mind, and <laughs> and you guys didn't mind. I mean, really, there's only a handful every generation that really deep down don't mind being a heel. It's it's a special knack, and and you guys certainly you guys certainly had it. We weren't afraid of the heat. We welcomed it much like you did. I mean, uh, watching you, you somehow you kind of get lost in the conversation sometimes about tag team wrestlers who are able to break away and become successful on their own. We always talk about Sean, you know, because he's like, you know, but you did something that was incredible. I mean, you and John were so synonymous with yourself. And then it's almost like you made people forget about the APA. I don't think ever, I don't think I ever made people forget about the Dudleys. I think what you were able to do was just on such a, such a next level. And it's a, it's a tribute to you, a tribute to you embracing that heat. And we know that Vince just wanted to pour that because he lived vicariously through you. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, he did. <laughs> Ted DiBiase said the same thing. He was on our show and Ted did the same thing. He said, Vince, like he was writing for himself. I knew when I'd go in there with Vince, he was like basically writing for himself. Like, if I could be a heel and I could do this 300 nights a year, this is what I would do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and you were smart enough to realize that. And you said, okay, boss, pour it on. Oh, and I'm going to go out there yeah. and, and look at everybody that got made being in the ring with you. So it's about embracing that heat and not being afraid of it. And in today's day, um, I don't know how closely the both of you follow anything, but I have to watch everything. There are so many performers out there who are afraid of the heat. Yeah. They shy away from it. They'll only go so far. Uh, the one right. kid that sticks out to me right now is MJF and AEW. I think he's doing a fantastic job. Yeah, and a lot of them really don't want to be a heel on social media. They want to be a heel. They want to play a heel on television and talk about being a heel. They don't really want to. They don't want to walk through the airport and be called names yeah. or have you yeah, put up their phone and, and have people say, you know, you're really an asshole or you're really a bad person. And, you, you, know, you two guys hit a right on the nail. If, if you don't want to be a hill and you don't embrace that, that, that attitude of being a hill, then you're not going to be a successful hill. You're just going to be one of those middle of the road right. guys that, that, that just, just exists and be in the middle of the card. I, I remember when, when Jack and I were talking about, you know, turning hill against Steamboat and Youngblood, he said, do you know what being a hill? Cause you know, he'd gone all over the country as champion being a hill here, baby face here. He said, it, it's, it's totally different. He said, the fans are spitting on you and then you got a temper. You, you can't go chase them out of the arena. You can't do, you can't farmers carry their ass. You can't do any of that stuff. And I didn't know what being a hill was all about until, until I got one of those, uh, hillbilly carolina towns and and we turned hill and I, I i felt exactly what a hill was supposed to be like or until we went to lubbock texas turned hill on terry and dory funk and a damn cowboys and killer carl cox had to come out with a nine foot chain to save her ass you got to embrace being a hill and once you embrace that and have that in your mind and then then you're going to be successful but you two there i mean you guys you guys bought into the theory you knew what you had to do you knew the results of it, and man, both of you shine there. Both of you became Hall of Famers because you didn't mind being a hill. But uh, having that attitude, and then you know, having a partner like you guys did, uh, Ben with uh, Devon, Bubba, that had to be be a thrill too, and, and an excitement because and, and this guy, he he was spectacular and all the moves. It, it was. You know, it would mutt Jeff basically that. I'm not talking about size different, but work, work. He'd go out there and do all the stuff. You do you come in and kick ass and take names later, man. And that's, that's yeah. what made you guys click. We had a chemistry together. It worked. <clears throat> Devon was trained, you know, really well by Johnny Rods. And we, and just like Ron and John, we had a friendship. I mean, me and Devon were attached at the hip for 20 years. Wow. 
20 years of My going brothers. hard and, and, you know, rooming together or, you know, traveling together. We did everything together. And after 20 years of being by each other's side, you kind of need a break. And after we had accomplished everything that we could possibly accomplish, that's when we decide, all right, we'll go our separate, separate ways for now. But you have to have a camaraderie. Otherwise, <clears throat> we've heard stories about other tag teams who hate each other. And these guys are miserable. You and John, you and Ron, you, you were best buddies, just like me and yeah. Devon were. And I think that's why the four of us gelled so well. Yeah, I do too. I have no doubt about that. You know, we, we all three of us share something in common that neither one of us, none of us, and none of our teams made a big deal about. We're all part of some of the original biracial tag teams. You know, Jerry had Thunderbolt Patterson, one of the very first black and white tag teams. You had do a Devon one of the very first with ECW, and then me and Ron. You know, because back back in the seventies and eighties, back when Jerry first kind of broke that mold. You know, then you had Owen, obviously, and uh, Coco Beware. But there weren't most of the times you had natives with natives, cowboys with cowboys, Samoans with Samoans, Italians with Italians, Japanese with Japanese. You didn't cross that line. It was just kind of everything was a stereotype. We broke that stereotype, and not only broke it, but didn't make a big deal out of it. It was, I, I don't think we, it was never a big deal. Right. I, d, 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 Ron was your partner. Devon was my partner. And that's all it ever was. We were two men on the same journey, two professionals on the same journey with the exact same goals in mind to make a shitload of money and be the best at what we do. And that was it. And have a, and have a blast doing it. Yeah. WWE tried to do something one time about, uh, you know, one of the first racial, uh, biracial tag teams and, and, in one of the in WWE that really kind of made it, you know, and stayed together for quite some time. And Ron wouldn't allow it. And I was so glad he wouldn't, you know, because he said, this isn't about race. This is about two friends. If you make it about race, then it becomes about race. He said, it's much more important as an example that there's nothing made about it because there was nothing to it. And with me and Devon, it was always 50, 50, the, the white guy didn't shine more than the black guy or the black guy didn't sh shine more than the, white guy it was always an even amount we were very conscious about staying right here with one another um same thing with you and ron when i thought of the apa you guys were you brought 50 percent to the table and so did he and ron was a former you know uh, oh yeah ron first, was... uh, african-american world heavyweight champion but you guys were at that level and you were a cohesive unit like when i watched hawk and animal it was always like Hawk had the edge to me. There was just a little bit something extra about Hawk. When I watched you and Ron, same, same. Me and Devon, same. It wasn't until you went off on your own that we realized, all right, John has something special and unique that now is able to come to the forefront. And that was all due to Ron. I mean, I, I was just in Hawk Bradshaw. I'd been first match for <laughs> several years. <laughs> It wasn't like there was anything great about me, you know, that Ron. You, you, were just, you were just thrilled to be in that position to be there. Oh right? my goodness. Yeah. They asked Ron if, uh, if yeah. it was okay to tag with me. They didn't ask me if it was okay to tag with Ron, <laughs> you know, cause they knew I would accept. I mean, that, that was freaking Ron Simmons, man. It was the first black heavyweight <laughs> champion, which is how he likes to classify himself. That's why we say black heavyweight champions and African-American because that Ron likes to, that's how Ron's the phraseology Ron likes to use. And uh, it was, it was all Ron. He was the much bigger name, and he made sure that was 50-50 because he was taking care of me, which that was really cool of Ron. That's how, that's how Ron is. He did one day, we're sitting there in the, before the matches, or watching some kids practice some big flips and flops, and somebody said, hey, Ron, what would you do if they want to do that with you? He goes, tag John. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I wouldn't be there. <laughs> one of my one of my, the stories about rod that always pops me is i don't know if you remember this john mr briscoe uh we were doing a house show i don't know where but it was the dudley's the apa and edge and christian and michael hayes was the agent on the house show which was very odd michael really wasn't on the road with us very often uh do, it was, you know normally it was jack lanza um so in the three-way, we had to eliminate the APA first, and the Dudleys were going to eliminate the APA. And Michael said, hey, Ron, I how about the Dudleys that. give you the 3D on the floor? And Ron looked at him and went, fuck you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> so, yeah, then, then Mike goes, okay, maybe we'll take it on John. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're in a house show. He won't run and take a yeah. finish yeah. on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, take the finish yeah. on the floor. <laughs> yeah. Bubba, Bubba, you told this story many times, and, 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 and Spike had to, had to be a trooper and a half, but uh, Spike, he, he helped you guys uh, perfect the, uh, the, the, the jump off the top there, right? And, uh, and he took it uh, like thousands of times. He helped you perfect your finish move for Spike, doesn't he? Spike is a very, very important part of me and Devon's journey, <clears throat> and I really hope that Spike one day gets his – chance to, 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 to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Everybody needs somebody to get them over. You can't do this on your own, as, as the both of you know. We, we need somebody. And Spike was on the, uh, you know, uh, on the, 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 the end of the ass kicking every single night. We beat the shit out of him, and he just kept coming. He's one of the toughest guys I have ever come across in this industry. He would tell me and Devon, you guys do whatever you need to do. Don't worry. I'll be fine. I trust you. And uh, I, I can't thank him enough. I, I love him to death. Anybody that's ever worked with him knows that he was willing to put his body on the line for them to help anybody get over. He was the ultimate underdog. He had so many great matches with Bigelow in ECW. Um, he's very respected by the boys. Yeah. Um, he, he helped us out tremendously because of his willingness to do whatever we needed to do to get over that night. I know his run in the WWE, he was so well respected by, by all of us guys in the office. You know, when we had something very complicated and we wanted something very important done that was just right on the edge of bed, well, should we do this or not? Well, nobody would say Spike Dudley could do it. You know, and Spike, Spike was like a Gumby, man. He could, he could contort his body. He could do anything you wanted. So. If you had a move somebody was trying out, Mike Dudley would be there, and he'd have his hand up, and he'd have a smile on his face. He'd do it, and after he did, it, whether he was carried back to the dressing room or walked back on his own, he still had that smile on his face and saying, thank you very much. I mean, what, what a professional that young man is. And you're John, right. He John, deserved to be in any Hall of Fame. I think, that John, you've been in the ring with Spike, right? Many, many times. Yeah, I love Spike. Uh, Spike was just the best. I like Spike as a person and as a performer. Uh, I mean, Spike yeah. was just awesome to be around. So funny, yeah. so understated, never cared, just walked around dressing his, drinking his coffee, and he goes, Spike, we're going to throw you off the building tonight. Good chance you're going to die, and then you get covered by a bus. Okay, what what segment? And that was it. That's all they want, that's all they want to know. <laughs> He, he, he was tough. Um, one night uh, I, I was looking for him and I couldn't find him. And I walk into the men's room and I see his little boots in one of the stall. He used to spray paint them with polka dots. And uh, I was like, Spike, you in here? And all I heard was, <laughs> and this big cloud of smoke came out of the stall. And I was like, oh, that's how you're able to do it every night. That's why nothing hurts. <laughs> hey, tell him about the time. I, I was watching some interviews with you today. That uh, Spike asked Vince for some weed. Me, Shane, Dreamer, and Spike. This is when Shane was on the road with us. We're doing yeah. house shows. We're probably driving at three in the morning, have no business being on the road, but we were. <laughs> Shane looks over at me and he goes, Come on, let's call Pop. And I'm like, Horrible idea. Do not call your father at three in the morning. And he's like, no, 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 come on, let, let's call him. Like, he, he's he's probably sleeping. He's like, he, he never sleeps. <laughs> hey, and before I could say anything else, he's dialing the phone. And he's like, Pop, yeah, yeah, no, no, Bubba wants to talk to you. And he hands me the phone. I'm like, Vince? He's like, why are you corrupting my son, Bubba? I was like, you know it's the other way around. Ha, ha, ha. Don't do anything stupid and make sure you get home safe. Okay, so he hands it back, back to Shane. I hand it back to Shane, and Shane goes, hey, Spike, you want to say hello to Vince? Spike doesn't think Vince is on the phone. Spike thinks it's a rib. <laughs> Spike takes the phone. He goes, hey, Vinny, you got any good pot? And Vince starts <laughs> Spike threw the phone at the windshield. Shane's phone exploded. Spike was terrified. And the next day at TV, he did everything he possibly could to avoid Vince. <laughs> 
You became yeah. very good friends with Shane, right, Bubba? You, yeah. you and Shane you know, went yeah. down the road quite a bit together. Yeah. That had we, to had, be a, we had a lot of fun together. We, yeah. we just got along. We just got along as 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 men, as friends. It was never yeah. about wrestling. We just enjoyed each other's company. Me, Shane, and Tommy had a good camaraderie. You also rode the Rock some too, right? We spent about a year on the road with Rocky, me, Devon, and Rocky. And if and before Rocky was riding with us, it was Rocky and Mark Henry. Yeah, so I remember that. Just, once again, you know, when you're on the road as much as we all were, you got to be in the car with people that you can get along with for, for 300 miles. Same music, same interests, just enjoy each other's personalities. And we got, and the three of us got along great. And we, you know, we don't go out to dinner after, you know, Rocky at that time, obviously he would just call Morton's and they keep Morton's open until two in the morning for us and whatever. But uh, it was, it was a, it was a genuine friendship, genuine camaraderie. Stay in touch to this day. Has he put you in any of his movies or anything? <laughs> no. Damn it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> me either. <laughs> yeah, me. No, I'm just not. I'm so, I'm so, I don't mean, I'm not taking a shot at the rock. I think I'm so happy. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. No, I'm, no, I'm not. <laughs> I got along with him, I guess. Well, uh, hey, uh, Bubba, the, the time, where was it? Was it in Cincinnati that you almost came in our car? It was somewhere in the Midwest. You almost came in our car going about 70 miles down the road, out miles an hour going down the road. This is, I don't think I've told this story. And if I have, I don't remember it, but. <laughs> We're driving, Devon's driving, it's afternoon, we're driving to the yep, shop. Middle of the day. It was middle of the day, on a highway, and I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of slumped over in the passenger seat, and Ron was driving your car, and you guys, I think we're in a, I, don't, I think you were in a truck, but you guys pull right up next to us, doing about 70 miles an hour, and I mean inches yeah, yeah. away, yeah, yeah. inches and you scared the shit out of Devon. And Devon yeah. swerved out and swerved. And you guys go flying past us, yeah. right? And you're, I could tell you're just laughing your ass off. And I got to hear Ron now. Oh, 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 that was funny. You got them good, job. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, Devon, speed up and pull up right next to them. He's like, what are you going to do? I said, don't worry. Just get next to them. I don't care how fast you're going. Just get next to them and hold the car steady. We put, no, wait, you were driving. John. I was driving. I was you driving. Were driving. <laughs> yeah, I was driving. And I, and if my memory starts to be correct, which I've been hitting the head a lot, actually, I've been hit by your clothesline a lot, <laughs> right next to you. And I lean out the window doing about 70 miles an hour. And didn't I try to open your door? Tried to open the door. It was locked. Thank God. He didn't come in the car with us. So I'm driving and I, we forgot all about it. Me and Ron just driving. You know, we, we, Run scared the Dudleys. We're all happy with ourselves. Next thing you know, the I hear the door trying to be open. And I thought, what in the world? I'm going 70 miles an hour. And I look and Bubba is out the car door and he's trying to open up my door going down the road. 70 <laughs> miles an hour, Mr. Briscoe. Oh. And, and and I just the, the horror on on Ron's face in the patch of the seat. Like he was telling, he was telling John, like I Told you that white boy is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, that sounds like a Harley race move. Uh, move. Uh, Harley used to get out there and he'd turn his light uh, lights off and come up. All of a sudden, you wouldn't see anything behind him, but all of a sudden, come up and just bump you at going 90 miles an hour, bump you, then back way off. And what the hell was that? Then pretty soon you'd see Harley come up beside you know, laughing his ass off. <laughs> that stuff doesn't go on anymore. Thank no. goodness <laughs> you couldn't do it. That the roads are just too crowded now. But back first time it ever happened to me, we were going from San, San Angelo to Abilene, Texas, and I'd clothesline Greg Valentine. He says I cracked his tooth or something. I don't know if I did, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're driving back, flying, flying. There's nobody on the road, and I look up and I see these lights on bright, and all the guys in the car start laughing. And I thought, why are they laughing? We're getting pulled over by a cop or something. Oh, it's too late to slow down now. And the car just keeps coming and finally just hits me. Had to be going 90 or 100. And it was Greg Valentine. He just had a few beers. And all the guys in the car are laughing. I'm like, this isn't funny. He just wrecked my car. And <laughs> then I realized, okay, it is funny. <laughs> John, do you remember the story? I don't know if we can even tell this, but I'm going to go into it. We'll 
you know, be politically correct, or whatever. Do you remember we're in like, I don't know, Duluth, and we're like in a Holiday Inn, and I remember calling for room service and like we can't deliver. You can come down and pick it up. I remember coming down into the lobby to pick up my food, and I look into the bar, and I see you in the bar with this look on your face. You have this blank look on your face, like the thousand yard stare that a Marine gets. And you're just looking across the bar and you're like, Bubba, come here. And you called me yes. in the bar. Yes. And what was, was going on? Uh, there was Cedar, a convention. Cedar Ames, Cedar Ames Iowa. Uh, Cedar, Ames, uh, Cedar Falls, it was in Iowa. It was in Iowa. Yeah, okay. Cedar country. Because it was the middle of nowhere. Yes, I remember. And what did, kind of did they have clothes on? They, oh, they had clothes on. <laughs> no, they, they, I had clothes on too. No, no, it was a uh, like a transvestite dress-up convention, but it was guys it was like farm guys. So it wasn't like guys who were trying to look like women. It was like big six foot four inch burly guys who looked like they just got off a tractor, and they're all wearing dresses, high heels, everything. And there's like the whole bar is full of them. And I'm sitting there just looking at trying to figure out what's going on. I can't believe it. And that's what I called Bubba over. I said, I said, Bubba, come here. I said, you got to look at that. Look at this. And so we're sitting there looking at him. Then I called Taker. I said, you got to come downstairs. I said, I don't know what's going on. I said, you got to come see this. He goes, I mean, I said, come downstairs. So he came downstairs and all the boys come down there. So now you got all the wrestlers on one side. Oh. You got all these farm boys in dresses on the other side. And we're all looking at each other. And they're pointing at us. They went, look, that's the wrestlers. We're pointing at them going, those are farm boys for some reason in dresses. <laughs> <laughs> it was the craziest thing ever. Ever. We had a, we had a great time with them. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We got them on both ends. What are you doing? And they're going, well, you just dress up in dresses. And I, oh, okay. Man, that so we was started funny. talking to them. They were, they were funny guys. So next thing you know, you get all the wrestlers sitting with all the guys that are dressed up. Nobody gave, nobody gave a shit about none of them. Care. Oh, we had funny. the best night that night with all of those guys. And the, the if you try to tell the story of it, it's almost impossible to do. I wish somebody would have videotaped that. That 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 was funny because yeah. just that look on your face, like you could not believe what you would. You needed somebody to confirm what you were seeing. You're like, right. it's, it's like we were sneaking up on a herd of water buffalo. You're like, look That's over right. there. <laughs> be, be, be very still. They can't see us. Yeah. Oh, that was great. Uh, Baker came down to the same thing. He just looked. He goes, just looked. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was uh, awesome. Which is what I think. You know, you know Mr. Briscoe, I got to tell you something um, that uh, uh, I don't know if I've ever told you this before. One of the biggest lessons I ever learned in this business was that di directly from you. And uh -oh. I, I know you taught a lot of things <laughs> to a lot of different people, but I remember one night on Raw, me and Devon were supposed to wrestle, I don't know, maybe the Hardys or Edge and Christian for the championships. And at the last time, creative changed, go figure. And uh, we were the champions at the time. And instead of working on Raw, you asked us to work a dark match. And I said, sure, Jerry, no problem. And, you know, me and Devon said, absolutely. And we worked a dark match against Sean Devari and Austin Aries. Two, at that time, just local enhancement talent right. who, who got a shot that night. And I, I remember walking into the agent's room and I said, Jerry, I guess you just want us to squash them, right? And you said, Bubba, if you want to squash them, go right ahead. But remember, if you don't make anybody, you didn't beat anybody. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I got it. It, it never left. That's yeah. one of those moments where the light bulb goes off yeah. and I'm like... <laughs> Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I get yeah. it. And we did the match. Ex we built a match based on that exact instruction. And we let them get like four minutes of heat on us. Well, four minutes of heat on Devon. Who am I kidding? <laughs> <laughs> Devon gave me the hot tag. I blew a simple comeback. By the time we hit that finish, you would have thought we had just beaten the APA for the World Tag Team Championships. Place went crazy, and I just remember going, I'll never forget that lesson ever. 
Thank and, you. And, thank and, you. And that's something that I pass down to the students yeah. now of, a, you know, yeah. don't squash anybody, yeah. you know, don't eat, eat them up, make them before yeah. you beat them. Yeah, that was an old Dory Funk senior lesson that I learned years ago. You know that uh, you, if you're going to if you're going to beat somebody, beat them with your finish and beat them up pretty good. You know you got to let them have one little hope spot there, and that's what I try to pass along to so, so many of these young guys. Just a little bit of psychology, you know, is, is all you need sometimes. Just one thought, like you said, one thought in your mind completely changed the concept of the match and probably made the match so much better than going out three minutes squashing the guys, you get your hand up. What have you accomplished? You know, you beat a couple of guys that everybody knew you were going to beat, but if you give them a little hope spot, a little chance, then you beat them, man, they beat somebody, you know? So. John, remember all that hope you gave to the public enemy? <laughs> yeah, as much as you guys did. Well, don't you even think yeah. about it. Jerry was that gorilla when that happened. Uh, that was that was my fault too, Bubba. <laughs> yeah. I was at home watching, knowing that we were in talks already. When wow. I saw that happening, I remember me and Devon talking. I'm like, "What the fuck are we getting ourselves into over here?" Because you know we're going to wind up with them. Oh, of course, yeah, you, you knew, yeah, you knew you were right first. We you were going to get the APA. It's you know almost everybody that came in, you know. Right. We had to get somebody to put these guys over. Blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> but Kurt Angle, that was one of the first matches he had ever seen in person. And when he saw yeah, it, he like, yeah. I'm not sure I want to do this business. He was, <laughs> that was in Pittsburgh. And they were just for as a Pittsburgh, Kurt, yeah. And he was sitting on the front row, I think, for the show. That was a heat show. And Kurt's like, I don't think, I'm not sure I want to do this. <laughs> I thought you said that step was a work. Yeah. <laughs> Briscoe uh, said, are, you guys are going over, right? And I said, yes, sir. I just don't know if it's going to be 15 seconds or 15 minutes. We're going over. There's not a doubt in our mind we're going over. You know, Rocco and Johnny, God rest their souls. Um, they, made, they made the first two weeks in WWE difficult for us. Yeah. Because I, I uh, think you guys yeah, all assumed did. that we were going to be much worse. Right. No, no, I, I think in fact, we didn't know. I don't remember exactly. We didn't know. You know, they they came in with. I mean, they came in that day and they walked in the building at five thirty. The show started like at six thirty or doors at six thirty. I mean, they didn't. They wouldn't even come on time. You know, they would come late. They'd come walking in. They make a grand entrance coming in. You know, it wasn't. They they flaunted the rules. They weren't. They they didn't show much respect at all when they came in. So we, we I think we kind of thought that was an outlier, but we didn't know. You know, because we didn't see a lot of ECW because we were on the road every night. So it wasn't like we got to see the, the other guys that were working. At, that was our competition or something. Bubba, you guys came in completely different. You guys came in with open mind. You guys come in, you know, you, you, you knew you were going to get over because Vince had talked to you guys and told you that there was a path for you guys and how to, how to, how to, how to manipulate like that past so you guys came in with a different attitude than than the public enemy did and and i you know i hate to to, to pile dirt on, on on them because they're, they're basically good guys as you know but you can't come in, you know yourself you can't go to any place with an attitude when you first come in you got to come in with hey i'm yours what do you want from it and that's how you guys came in that's the reason the Dudleys were so accepted, I think, in the WWE, right, John? Because of the Absolutely. attitude that you guys yeah. came in with and willing to do business with anybody. And that, well, that, what that, did you think? What did you think about us? I mean, did you know any of the story? I mean, because you guys had problem. Had you guys already had your problem with Public Enemy at that time? The Public Enemy got brought back to ECW to do yeah. business with us because they were the it tag team. They had left. Me and Devon kind of surpassed them. And then Paul asked us, how do you feel about bringing the public enemy back? And I was like, this will work because they were the it tag team in ECW. And now we'll, we'll finally go head to head. So Paul said, I want them to lay you out in the ECW arena. I said, great. Okay. Bring them back with pomp and circumstance. We did business. They laid us out and we stayed down. The next week in, or the next set of TV or wherever the hell we were in Detroit, it was time for them to return the favor for us. So now we hit the ring. We get into them, get into it with them. We 3D the both of them. And as you know, John, if you take the 3D, you don't move. You know, we protected our finish until the, the very end. We were very big believers in protecting your finish. 
We hit them with the 3D. We leave the ring and we're halfway up the ramp and they're up on the microphone. And me and Devon looked at each other and did to them what you did to them a couple of months later. We <laughs> beat the shit out of them and they were never seen again. And so did you, when you saw what we did to them, did you think that that was what it was? Or did you think that we were just taking advantage of guys who had just come into business? Or not come into business. Rock, They've been I, in a while, come to WWE. I kind of knew Rocco and Johnny. So I, I wasn't surprised. I'm sure that they, they must have had a bit of a chip. <clears throat> Leaving ECW, they were such a big deal. But when you get into the world of the WWE, you get humbled that quickly. And if you don't, the boys are going to get, forget about the office. The boys are going to get you because the boys police the boys, as, as we know. So when I saw that all going down, uh, I figured it was, you know, on them. And, and listen, they were going to, somebody's going to get fed to somebody just to get tested. Back in the day, that's how we tested each other. I'm going to punch you in the face. You're going to punch me in the face. And then we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens from there. We see how we handle it as men. Um, they didn't handle it, but I knew that that was going to make life a little bit difficult for me and Devon uh, when we first came in. And, I, and I, I remember it like it was yesterday. Like we had to attack you guys. And I said, Devon, no matter what we do, whether we take care of them, whether we beat the shit out of them, they're going to beat the shit out of us. So we might as well give it to them first and show them that we're, we respect them, but we're not afraid of them because they're going to hand us our ass anyway. And that first night, I cracked you with that two by four. Oh, my God. <laughs> Bubba, Jerry, Bubba hit me so hard with that two by four. I lost feeling in my feet and my hands. Wow. That's I love how hard he hit me. I literally <laughs> am sitting there thinking, he just paralyzed me. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I don't, I've never, I don't, of course, I haven't been hit by many two by fours. I wrestle hacksaw very often. <laughs> I've never been hit like that in my life. Wow. And Jerry, I didn't want to hit, I didn't want to use a two by four because it's hard to work a two by four. Yeah. You can't get a grip. So I remember, I remember going to you guys and I was like, uh, Ron, I'm like trying to be so humble and nice. I'm like, you know, the two by four, it's kind of hard to get a grip. You know, maybe we could use, and Ron cuts me off and he goes, you do know how to work a two by four, don't you? <laughs> I said, yes, sir. No, There's no good answer to that. <laughs> you say no. You're like, huh? Yes, yeah, <laughs> And then there was that live shot that we did on Monday Night Raw, where I think we laid you guys out again. And now, Jerry, we're on the Raw set, and we're going to get interviewed by Michael Cole. And this is live, live. And, and understand, the we have had the, the living hell beat out of us like no one had ever beaten it out of us and we we just sold, you know we sold it didn't have a lot of choice sold it and <laughs> stay down so now it's our turn and now we're gonna go live and ron and john are just right off the set they're waiting to do their run-in on us and about a minute before we go live jerry i remember looking and all the boys started to filter into the backstage area to watch this live shot. And when I saw that, I knew something was you about know. to go down. I just, me and Devon were just, all right, whatever. You know, here it comes. And, you know, we're going to go live in five, four, three, two, one. And we start talking. And I can see steam coming out of Ron and Sean's noses. They were ready to kill us. And that's exactly what they did. They hit the set. They beat the crap out of us. Ron Simmons is picking up a 50-gallon drum, yeah. a shoot 50-gallon drum, and just having his way with the both of us. <laughs> they beat us up so freaking bad. And then when they yelled, cut, me and Devon got up. We shook their hands. And I think from that moment on, John, oh. everything was totally fine. Everything was fine. You know, we didn't tell any of the boys, you know, we didn't make, you know, make a big deal out of it. You know, obviously we're going to get ours back, but the boys just knew because they had seen what had happened yeah. to us. And then right that, we, we took it straight back to the Dudleys as best we could. And as soon as they did, Dudleys got up and said, hey, thanks, guys. And we said, thanks. That was it. Yep. We, were, we were good friends from that second forward and worked together so many freaking times. But you still beat the hell out of each other every night when you went to the ring, which is what made it work. <laughs> John, you once told me a story, and I, it, 
me and you had a singles match. Yep. And I went to the ring first. And did Vince tell you to beat me up and blow me up? I don't. I don't think you, so. you told me he said you told me that Vince said let's beat him up and blow him up and let's see what he's got. You come to the ring and I just remember me and you punching each other in the face. We I remember punching each other in the face a lot, and then, a lot. <laughs> and then I think we I think we both started to laugh and we decided, you know what, let's yeah. work. It's a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> we did. We we're hitting each other about as hard as we can with a punch, square on the jaw, not hurting each other. You know, guys, they talk about we're you know guys are trying to hurt each other. We were stiff, but not unsafe. And I mean, we were hitting each other about as hard as you could hit each other, right on the jaw. And we come back, Bubba goes, I'm okay with that, if you're okay with that. And I said, I'm okay with it. And then we both kind of thought, you know, there's got to be an easier way to do, <laughs> to do this. <laughs> I don't remember the Vince part. I, that It, it could have happened, and it could have been somebody else that said that. I, I don't remember. Okay. I, I it could have been, me could have been somebody that. else, you know. The one thing that we never, never happened, you know, people talk about Vince sent us after people that, that 100% never happened. You know, they never said go after this tag team or beat these guys up or do this or do that. I was, we were never, not one time told anything like that by anybody in the WWE as far as agents or, or anything else that kind of became a myth later, you know, after, you know, everybody has revisionist history. <laughs> they start changing yeah. things over time. Sure, sure. <laughs> now, yeah, how about we, the time? We love, we love being in there with you guys. Oh, we had so much fun with you guys. We, we had fun every single night that we did it. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. Yeah. How about the time in Atlantic City where Devon blew the hot tag? <laughs> Devon blew a couple of hot tags. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so Jerry, so we're working. We're working. We're working. Uh, last match, Atlantic City. I think the place was sold out. It was it was pretty full, which is unusual for Atlantic City because we didn't always do good business there. We had a good house that night, and we work our asses off. And all of a sudden, Ron, uh, I hit Ron for the tag. Bubba hits uh, Devon for the tag. Ron comes in smoking, and when he does, he grabs Earl Hebner and hides behind him, and hides behind him, and hides behind him. <laughs> and Devon thinks it's a false tag. <laughs> And Ron, Ron finally goes, Devon, stop. That's the hot tag. And Devon, Devon like, a, like a scolded child, goes, I'm sorry, Ron. And moves Earl out of the way and just feeds in for the first bump. <laughs> that's awesome. John, that, that's bad. But what about the garden when I tripped? Madison Square Garden, Jerry. This is Whoa, this I got to hear this, Bob. Tell Jerry, me, Bob. <laughs> it's. I think it's our first. It might have been our first show ever at the Garden. Wow! It's a house show. It's the Dudleys, the APA, and I think Edge and Christian again. And APA eliminate Edge and Christian. Heat on Devon. Go figure. And Bub is going to get the hot tag. I got my family there. I got my fraternity brothers from college there. The APA are heels. We're white hot baby faces at the time. 20,000 people in rumbling at the garden. They do a double down. Devon's crawling over. Devon gives me the hot tag. The place blows. I come in. I trip over the middle rope. <laughs> he doesn't just trip over the middle rope. So I oh. fed him from the other <laughs> side. Ron hits me with a tag, and I'm crawling in, you know, with my head down. I'm going to feed straight into a punch or something and take a bump. So I'm rushing across the ring because I know Bubba's going to get in pretty quick. And when, as I do, Bubba doesn't even catch himself. He falls face <laughs> first on the mat at my feet. <laughs> this, is the, this is the middle rope, too, Bubba. You don't yeah. go over the top. <laughs> Madison Square Garden. Wow. Bubba's got everybody he knows in the front row. But <laughs> besides that, we got 20,000 other people there. Right. Bubba double legs me and <laughs> takes me down, and he's punching me as hard as he can. I'm like, Bubba, you clumsy bastard. I didn't do it to you. <laughs> and I'm literally, I say, Ron, don't feed in. He's mad. <laughs> <laughs> He's mad. <laughs> so, 
we get to the back. And, and Bubba's like, oh, my, that's the worst thing I ever had. Worst thing, it's just terrible. It's a disaster. Madison Square Garden, I love this place. It's the Mecca. Ron goes, no, Bubba, it, it, it's not that bad. It, it, Bubba, it, sit, no, don't, don't, it's not that bad. Bubba said, my, my family was here. My old college coaches are my best friends here. Ron goes, yeah, that's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> Ron could make a lot of it everything oh, just the right way. And Bubba right. beat the living shit out of me because he tripped. <laughs> I was, I was. I know so why he's mad. mad. I'm just covered. I, I, I had, so I had, I had the honor of going in the ring. I think three, two or three times against the Dudley brothers. And man, I, I was scared to death to tell you the truth because I was an old man. I, you know, I, I shouldn't have been out there anyway. But that thought it was funny. But uh, you guys allowed me to actually go to the top rope and jump, jump off of a table onto you guys. I tell you what, I've never been so scared in all my life. When I was a kid, you know, I could go to that top rope and I could stand up there for ten minutes. You guys can do crisscrosses, never. But at, at 55, 56 years old, whatever I was, I got up on that top rope. I think X Pac was my partner, and you were on the table. And I appreciate you sacrificing your body because I didn't know where I was going to land. You said just jump as far as you can and spread out. I got up there, man, and I was I was teeter totter back and forth. I, and I, I I had to make the quickest jump of anybody that ever went to that top rope because as soon as I got up there, got upright, man, I went. I don't think it's my choice. I think it's just my fear just took. Me. But I landed it and I, I the table popped. Fortunately, because I was afraid the table would go pop. But you guys took so good care of me out there. It was it was it was a pleasure, man. Thank you so much. <laughs> It was our pleasure to be able to be in there with you and that table bump went great and it was good business and it worked. So yeah, yeah it was all good. Yeah. So, Bubba, you're used to uh, taking advantage of senior citizens. I mean, you, <laughs> you, had, you, you put May Young through a table. Oh yeah. That is still, in, I mean, people, if people thought about doing that today. They would get fired. <laughs> so, it's, but it was, it was the attitude era. I mean, it was insane. She was how out. old was she at the time? Do you know exactly how old she was at the time? 80. Wow. Oh, my. <laughs> and what she you told you guys, five... that he, she told you guys to treat her just like a treater, uh, one of the guys, right? Jerry, the first time we ever did anything with her, I had to pick her. We, slammed, we were going to give her the what's up headbutt. Yeah. And I remember slamming her, and I just I placed her down in the middle of the ring so easy because I didn't want to slam her. You know, we got what we needed out of it. And we got into the back, and she snatched me by the wrist, <laughs> like 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 Fez or Gotch. She snatched me by the wrist, and she said, "Hey, hot shot! If you're gonna slam me, you slam me like one of the boys." <sighs> yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> we put her through the table in the ring. We put her through the table off the top of the stage. The and then I was, I was with her. She went up to Vince. And she said, Vince, I want him to do me off the top of the cage. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Jerry, when can you, got... you imagine? Because you're set, you just Jerry's birthday was just recently, 75 years old. Can you imagine five years from now being powerbombed by Bubba Dudley off the stage? I couldn't imagine five years ago being powerbombed <laughs> off the stage. I mean, I he, couldn't he, imagine he, now, and I'm 54. Uh, 50. 56 he, he slammed me pretty damn good and i i wanted i wanted it like that the, i think the first time you guys you guys you guys did that slam to me i mean and it, it actually felt good i actually got a rush off <laughs> <laughs> that's old time but we'd like to step this you know and well, you guys she, want it. she was so willing and and she's another person that we will uh, eternally be grateful to for putting her, her body on the line for us an another person who helped get us over she's she's one of the uh the, the ladies that, that came through there that, that really set a template for her, for all the, all the rest of the girls to follow. I mean, she was rug, rugged. She was, by the way, the, the first woman ever to make an amateur wrestling team in the state of Oklahoma. She was that damn tough, you know, but the, wow. she brought it, she brought it to the professional world. And, and, but that bump is still talked about today. You know, it's, it's one of the iconic moments of the attitude era there that the Dudley put the May Young to off the stage. Uh, and, you know, we always talk about wrestle, WrestleMania moments, but I think Mae Young might be responsible for one of the greatest wrestlers' courts moments. You aren't kidding. The greatest <laughs> ever. 
The greatest and ever. I believe, I believe you were the prosecutor in that case. I was, yes, I was. Yeah, we Bubba had a meeting on here a few weeks ago. We were talking about just that. That was the greatest greatest moment in wrestler sport history. History. We, we have we have so much fun with this where this version has been told, but let's say, let's hear Bubba Dudley's version of it because it, they're hilarious. Every every time we hear this story, the people just go crazy about it. The, the wrestler court were were I think it was Teddy Long being brought up on show. It was oh, Teddy yeah, Long no, being brought up. Yeah, for being it was Sunday. definitely Teddy Long because Teddy, you know, Doctor Roma Scavage used to come <laughs> to the shows and he would give the boys, you know, here's some penicillin or here's some of this, here's some of that. Well, he also had Viagra, which had just come out, by the way. You know, it's not like it was, you know, like now it's just come out. And, yeah. So, you know, all the boys wanted a sample of the Viagra. And and Teddy Long was getting, I guess, <laughs> a lot of Viagra from a Dr. Lomas Gavich. Yeah. And he was selling it to the boys. He's <laughs> giving it for free. You want to talk so, about, car- you want to talk so about he, Carney. So yeah. he could pay tolls for John, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so he's getting him and you know, and he's selling it back to the boys. And you know, Ron and John found out about it. And Ron and John brought him up on charges, and John was the prosecutor. And we took him to court. And I don't think Taker was the judge. I think it was Triple H. That's right. Taker was off the road for some reason. Oh. Could have been injured or, or something. Yep. He was not on the road. Triple H filled in. And I think uh, I think Road Dog might have been a character witness and everything. Yes, else. he was. And <laughs> and I don't remember those details, but I do do you remember May Young being called as a witness or a character witness or something? And she stood up and she goes, I don't know what all you boys are complaining about. And she starts thrusting her hips and she goes, I love that Niagara. And <laughs> the place popped <laughs> to watch because May, even though she's a woman, a, 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 She's still one of the boys, and yeah. she's humping the air like one of the boys. <laughs> Bring it on. I love it. <laughs> and, and, Triple H, and Triple H, the judge, kept saying, well, May, you know, some of the boys with their Niagara, and he kept saying Niagara, and she never caught on that it was, <laughs> it was something else. <laughs> it was one of the funniest moments oh. in wrestler's court history. Oh, we it, it was so funny. So, yeah, the, uh, <laughs> nothing but great things to say about May. You know, one thing I always did on commentary with 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 about Devon was always I'd always say, "Oh, the humanity!" When he'd go up to the top rope and do the the Hindenburg crash off the top rope <laughs> on the watch up, I say he's got the glide path of a sofa. And I was, <laughs> the, only reason I'm saying it, the only reason I'm saying it is to get a rise out of Devon. He never to this day sold it. Bubba did. Bubba goes, "Oh, the humanity! I love it." <laughs> <laughs> you, never you, ever sold it you made so much fun of him and uh, all i could do is laugh all the time uh, <laughs> and Devon, you know, jerry, never jerry, jerry ron and john would pull me on the side sometimes and say don't tag in Devon for the whole match <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we had so much fun with Devon. <laughs> oh. he was such a good sport about everything yeah he definitely was. He definitely yeah. was. You know, when he, he came down to that golf tournament in Athens, the guys loved him. Athens, Texas, East Texas, we put on a charity golf tournament for Make-A-Wish. You guys came down. It was very nice. And the guys liked him so much. One of the guys got him golf clubs. They loved him down there. Everybody yeah. loves Devon. Yeah. That was a great time. Yeah. That was a great time. Yeah. You guys were a few of the, few of the guys at uh, my wedding down in uh, Key West. Still have one of my favorite pictures ever, ever taken. I think I posted it once on social media. That's right. Yeah. You know, yeah. Jerry was supposed to be a groomsman and uh, he couldn't make it because uh, one of his sons made the state wrestling term. He goes, John, I'm so sorry. He goes, I promise I'll come to your next wedding. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and unfortunately, there hadn't been a next one yet. But, uh, <laughs> but, Bubba, you, Bubba you, you've got such a creative mind and you, you've been everywhere and you, you've worked for just about every title there is in existence there have you ever considered being at, at, at the office being a producer or being an agent or anything like that because your 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 mind oh, go Vince ahead. has offered me uh the position in the past he has told me <clears throat> you know when you're ready i'd love to have you you know here as a producer I don't think the job is the same job it used to be when you were a producer or an agent. I believe the producers and agents now just kind of 
carry the marching orders of creative to the boys. And I don't think the boys have as much input into things these days. Um, I, I do consider myself creative. And if I don't feel like that creative creativity can be put to work for the guys and, put, and the gals putting their matches together, I kind of feel stifled. I, I, I would try it one day. It's just, it, it seems different than when you and Pat and Jack and Michael and the agents that I grew up on and, and worked with than they are today. I don't know, John, you, you've been, you've been there more recently than me. I mean, could you ever be an agent? No, I tried it for a few months and, and I didn't really enjoy it. You know, I didn't have, you know, it's, you're trying to explain things and you're trying to explain things because it's in the best that you feel in the interest of the performers. And, you know, they have so many different ideas and they would, you know, what the ones that I dealt with, some of them were awesome. Absolutely awesome. I think who was awesome was Roman Reigns. He, he got everything. That was before he, you know, main evented all those WrestleManias. I just thought this, this guy is he's really smart. And but some of them, you know, they would you tell them something and they'd go run and try to change it. I, Guys, yeah. just tell me if you don't like it. I'm not yeah. gonna take it personal. Yeah. But it, it well, was, it, it, it was the same way back back when I was doing. I, I, you know, some guys. I mean, they were so difficult to work with. But I, I come to Bubba. Okay, Bubba, this is what this is the general ideal, and I'd, I'd always just give you the general ideal because I always felt that you guys are in the ring every night. You guys know what you do best, and you know how to sequence what you do best better than what I do because I'm not in there with you. But I, I would just give you a general idea of what, what we were looking for that night, come back to you about five minutes later, and you would have you would have so much information, lay the match out. It made so much sense. You you were just very creative in those days. And and uh, you know, that that was very important to me and 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 getting that help. And there were several guys you could go to and get that type of input. But there are some guys. Well, hell, you're you're the damn agent. Figure it out yourself. But you 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 were always uh, not only looking out for yourself, but you were looking out for the concept of the match and how to build a match to the ending that we wanted to get there, and generally get us there exactly where we wanted to be. But you, I, I, that's the reason I asked the question because you were you were just so creative when I was working with you. And I appreciate that, Jerry. And I just don't know if that freedom. Uh, is still there. When me and Devon had left in 2006, I remember what the WWE was like. And then when we went back in 2015, I remember feeling so stifled as a performer because you had to run almost everything by the agent. And uh, being told that uh, two guys don't bump and feed for a comeback anymore, or you can't do this behind the ref's back, or everything that had worked in the attitude era that made us all a lot of money. Mm. Now you couldn't do anymore. And there was not really a good answer as to why you couldn't do it anymore. It's just that they don't want it done anymore. So I, I kind of felt handcuffed and I saw how the, the agent, and I would get into it with my agents I, and I didn't care. Like it, if, if I felt like the agent wasn't doing their part to represent our side of the discussion and, or argument and that's what that's what we were there for basically but i don't know you're right i don't know if you know if they have that right anymore to... there is i remember dealing with an agent one time where i came up with something different and uh you know i was i, I felt passionate about it and i asked my agent to please go run it by vince and my agent said okay i will and then i followed my agent for an hour he never spoke to vince and then he came back to me and said yeah vince doesn't want to do that I lose all the respect in the world for you. And I would much rather be, you tell me to my face, you know what, Bubba, I don't want to go talk to him right now. If you want to go do it, you go do it. So, and you know, the problem with that, Bubba, is the problem is your, where your ego has, where your ego lies. Mm -hmm. Your ego has to lie in the match. You know, and that's one thing that, you know, Jack Lanza was, I think, one of the greatest agents of all time right. because his ego lied in the match. So it wasn't important to him if he says, hey, I want to do this finish. You know, if you told Jack, Jack, here's what I'm thinking because you've thought about something on the road trip. Here's what I'd like to try. Jack goes, we'll try it. And if you try it and it was successful, Jack was happy about it because the match got over, not because Jack's idea got over, you know, and too many guys, and this goes to the talent too, for boys. So the girls, their ego, if their lies in themselves, that's the wrong place. It's got to lie in the match. And once it lies in the match, 
everything else kind of works itself out because you're working toward a common ending and common goal. And, and Lanza, I mean, obviously one of your favorite agents, one of mine also, because we spent so much time on the road with him. He was our agent, what, 90% right. of the time on the house shows? Yeah, yeah. You know? So everything was kind of going through Lanza. And what you just said is so true. Go up to Jack and say, hey, Jack, we'd like to try this tonight. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, yeah. and, and, that, and that was it. It was very, you know, trial, you know, trial and error. And I, and I always had uh, a great relationship with him and appreciated being able to learn from him. But yeah, the, uh, that's why I love being on Busted Open, Jerry, because I get to look at the entire business <clears throat> and try to evaluate the entire business as honestly as possible. The same way like a Shannon Sharp can watch every, every football game. You know, I'm sure the sh same way that if John watched every single product out there, he could tell you all the positives and all the negatives. A lot of these fans today don't want to hear any of the negative. You know, they, they want to close their ears. They want to cover their eyes. No, everything about our company is perfect. And what you're just trying to do is give constructive criticism and say, Here's how they can make it better. I never go on the air and say something sucks or this was the shit or this guy or this guy, gal is horrible. I take what they did and I just try to say, here's what they could have done to make it better for the match and the fan, thus making it better for themselves and their opponent. And that's your answer, Jerry. You say, by the way, it's the Joe Rogan of sports podcast. Can't nobody afford him to be an agent right now. This is <laughs> The man's printing money over there on Busted <laughs> Open. <laughs> Bubba, two, uh, WrestleMania 2000, I don't want to keep you forever, but WrestleMania 2000, when you first came out with the tables, ladders, and chairs, uh, did you guys have any idea at the time how big this was going to be? I mean, I know probably somewhere during the match, when you're in a great match like that, you realize this is special. You know, I'd always think if you're in something that's really working, I just don't want to screw it up because I know it's going to be really cool unless I make a mistake and make it uncool. Did you guys, what point did you realize that this was going to be something special? So WrestleMania 2000 was actually the three-way ladder match that a lot of people confuse with TLC1. It was just a ladder <coughs> match in which we did decide to incorporate tables and chairs. We knew going into the match that the three teams had chemistry. And you know, John, as part of a tag team, sometimes it's difficult to just find one team that you have a great chemistry with. Oh, yeah. Not only did we have chemistry with you, you know, you and Ron, we had chemistry with Matt and Jeff, Edge and Christian, and all the tag teams during the Attitude Era really gelled well together. But there was something unique about those three teams. So, uh, Edge and Christian and the Hardys had had their uh, that ladder match, I think, at No Mercy in 99. And then us and the Hardys had the table match at the Royal Rumble 2000. And then all three teams kind of came together for that one triangle ladder match at WrestleMania 2000 in Anaheim. And it was when the match had ended that we knew, wow, we got that was we think that was special. We're not sure, but it felt special. It sounded special. And we, you know, when we came back, I remember standing in the Anaheim pond with Michael Hayes and Dr. Tom, because Michael Hayes and Dr. Tom always work together as producers and agents. And we're all just standing there. Everybody, we're just talking about it. Like, wow, that really went well. And, and Michael said, I love the way you incorporated, you know, the chairs and the tables too. I think I said this. I'm not sure. I said, yeah, if we ever did that again, we could call it TLC. And then I was like thinking to myself, oh, my God, that was such a uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, wrong person. Say it. Wrong person to tell. <laughs> Don't tell Michael Hayes that. <laughs> v Vince, I got something here. It's called table, ladder, and chairs. It's my idea. <laughs> and, and, and after that, it was, it was kind of off to the races for all three teams. Uh, I, like I said, it wasn't until after that match that I, all of us realized, all right, we got something here. 
not only not only the, the tables, ladders, and chairs, but the three of you guys, the three tag teams, had such chemistry throughout that entire run. There, you could put any any uh, any combination of those three teams together, and you knew you were going to have one of those one of those unforgettable matches each night you went in the ring. It was it was very important for us also when we got the call for the Hall of Fame. Um, because me and Devon had become so synonymous with Matt and Jeff and Edge and Christian mm -hmm. and me and Devon always, when the camera's on, our egos are full blast, just like anybody should. Mm -hmm. But when the camera's off, our egos are in check and we're ultra humble and we're very thankful for everything. And we know that without these other guys, our rise to the top wouldn't have been what it was, what it had been. So it was important for us to have all four of those guys on stage with us because I felt that that might be the last time that fans ever got to see the six of us in the same place at the same time. And I remember talking to one of the agents and they're like, oh man, I don't know if Vince is going to go for that. And I go, well, if you don't tell him, I will. And that's what we want. And they're like, oh, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll check. I said, if you don't want to go talk to him, I'll be more than happy to. And, uh, and Vince said yes to everything. And I remember going through rehearsal and Vince said uh, uh, something. There was three specific things that we wanted to do in that Hall of Fame speech. Matt and Jeff, Edge and Christian being one of them. And I said, he goes, what do you want to do? I said, this, this, and this. He goes, do you have to do all of them? I said, yes. He says, can you get it done in nine minutes? I said, no. I said, it's going to take 20, but I'll give you an entertaining 20. He said, okay. Now is it? I just wanted those six guys to be together one last time. Right. I mean, John, like, like if you had the opportunity, wouldn't Eddie be standing by your side? Oh my goodness, in a heartbeat, yeah, uh, not a doubt about it. He, he was so instrumental in my career, absolutely. That was the one thing that I, that I missed, you know. And there in the middle of my speech, I said, you know, thank you, Viva La Raza, you know, it's just because Eddie meant so much to me. So yeah, that if I could have. No, no doubt about it, you know, because you, you want to honor the people that were that were so responsible for what you brought and what you became. And Eddie was as responsible as anybody, you know, he, he and Ron both. Do you, do you think that to Eric, because you had uh, Road Dogg and Billy also, you had Sean and um, Hunter as well, but not not as often as the tag team during that era. But you had, you know, some really great tag teams. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was the greatest era you're, you're a bit of a wrestling historian, kind of like me and Jerry are. You think that was the greatest era of tag team wrestling ever? I mean, you have to look at the other eras of tag team wrestling. You have to look at yourself as a fan and as a professional and then kind of compare them. Mid-80s, WWE tag teams, Hart Foundation, Demolition, um, uh, um, now I'm drawing a blank, but all these great tag teams, <laughs> you know, uh, the NWA with the midnight and the rock and roll. And everything. can we agree that the tag teams of the attitude era made more money and sold out or more arenas than any other tag teams ever had? I think that's fair. I mean, uh, now obviously uh, that had to do with, you know, not any Cole. one particular team, but all of us combined. Yeah. I think the aggregate, it was probably the best roster. Right. Now, obviously, you had yeah. Stone Cold, you know, The Rock that was, you know, headlining yeah. everything. I just think, uh, as John said, it was probably the best roster that any professional wrestling organization yeah. had ever put together. The roster that we had from top to bottom, anyway, as, as the old saying goes, this is the opening match could be a main event at Madison Square Garden at any time, you know, and that, that's the type of card that, that we, we were playing with back in those days where any one of you guys. I mean, would be on top of that at any chosen time. I, I definitely think, you know, from a guy from the 60s and 70s, that that was probably one of the greatest runs of tag teams that I had I had ever witnessed. So I, I think you're right, Bubba. That was probably the greatest set of tag teams ever. Hey, Bubba, before we go, the, if you were to name the top four tag teams of all time other than yourself, and you, you don't have to put in the, the APA and uh, Gerald Briscoe, <laughs> the Briscoe brothers, but just because we're here, uh, the top four tag teams of all time for your Mount Rushmore, who would it be? Uh, I can't give you the fourth because I have three. It's the Road Warriors, the Rock and Roll, and the Midnight. Good three. Uh, the, the, now we can start. If we, we want to start talking about Steiner's Harlem Heat 
uh, the Briscoes, the Funks, all of these other great teams. Yeah, that's fine. But like to me, the Road Warriors were the be all and end all because of their ability to do something as a tag team that I don't believe any other one tag team can do, could do. And that's put asses in seats. The yep. Road Warriors could sell out an arena with just their name on the marquee. That's right. They could. The, the Rock and Roll couldn't do that without the Midnight. You know, um, uh, any great tag team couldn't do it without the other tag team's name on that marquee with them. But if you just put, you know, appearing tonight, the Road Warriors, people put their hand in their pocket, took out their money to pay to see the Road Warriors. No other tag team had that ability, in my opinion. So this business is about generating a buck. It's about business. And much like Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair and all of the greats who were able to put an ass every 18 inches, the Road Warriors were able to do that. The working tag teams, the, you know, is there really a better Uber babyface tag team than the, the Rock and Roll Express? I mean, in my opinion, no. You know, the, the Midnight Express, any, and any incarnation of them, and John, I appreciate what you said, but I don't, I'm just happy if people mention our name in in that you know in that you know discussion. Me and Devon are we were very successful at what we did. Does that make us the best? Well, that's subjective. You know, we we were lucky, just like we were all lucky to have each other. We were lucky to have you. You were lucky to have us, Matt and Jeff, Edge and Christian, Too Cool, DX. Man, without all of us together, none of us are successful. So, and that goes that goes back to my day without the Funk Brothers, you know, the Briscoe Brothers, you know, then later with Ricky uh, Seaboat and Jay Youngblood, you know, and the Carolinas when we made our big hill turn up there. We were so blessed to have that type. We couldn't have done that with anybody else besides Ricky and Jay because they were so over as baby faces. And so it's so important. To, but yeah, you know, like you say, when you when you when you do that Mount Rushmore, it's so subjective on on the time and air and a, and a place and and just the environment and and the and the, uh, and the attitude going on during during those periods there. But let's face it, that attitude era that you start naming that roster off, man, that that's a Hall of Fame on anybody's books. And I was a huge fan of Road Dogg and Billy. I, I think yeah, yeah. total package wise. They're almost untouchable. Yeah, I agree. I, yeah. I agree. Road Dog and they, Billy to me are the are, are the best tag team in the history of, of, of the WWE when you look at being able to work, tell stories, and entertain. I mean, they had all the bases covered. I mean, and you know, every chance I see Billy Gunn, I try to rub up against him and you know, whatever whatever is coming out of his pores, I try to get to go into my pores. Oh, oh, <laughs> I tell I tell a joke old Billy all the time. He came down to my ranch and, and took a leak into the lake and all the fish gained 10 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Billy, I, I get older and I just look decrepit. He gets older. And, and they broke every line that you have. So well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he gets older, he looks like Thanos. He looks like a freaking <laughs> Billy won't age. I mean, I, I, I can barely get out of bed. Billy looks like he gets up and runs eight miles on his arms. I saw him two weeks ago, and he looks exactly the same. I mean, he, he looks, looks awesome. fantastic. <laughs> oh, my. It just infuriates me. I want to block him on Facebook yeah. because he puts pictures of himself up. It makes me so <laughs> mad. Like, we're not even close to the same age. We can't be. I was so happy, Jerry, to see you, Ron, and Billy uh, two weeks ago at the Thank ECW you. Arena. Same, and, same here. Yep, that, they're they're uh, certain was... there's there's certain guys that you just seek out, and I I wanted to see you, I wanted to see Billy, and I I was fortunate enough to be sitting right next to Ron, and I I I ribbed that guy, you know, it, Florida State legend icon, and so you know they're not having such a great season, so Ron Ron can't really get those ESP and apps, he don't know how to use them, so they just got beat by some underdog at Jacksonville take the week before so i'm sitting there on my phone i said ron you got that esp in the app i knew he did it. He said, no i said i got a score you don't like florida state 17 uh troy state 21 but wait a minute uh florida state just scored so they just went ahead 24 21 well, wait a minute troy state just ran the damn uh, kickoff back for a touchdown there <laughs> and so i had him going the entire night there so Hey, and John, the game was wasn't just, even going, Jerry. No, they, they weren't even playing towards it. 
That's it. Oh, that right. is it. Holy <laughs> cow. What a crew. Oh, man. Unbelievable. Yep. Brother yeah. Love Bias. Yeah, what a great crew. What a great <laughs> time. Had a great weekend down there in Key West. Very good. Well, Bubba, and my son, my son had to make the say tournament, and I missed it there. So. And, he, <laughs> and, he, and he didn't win the damn thing. So. <laughs> well, Bubba, I've been so excited to have you on. Uh, I know you, you know, you're such a big deal. We had to go through your agent's agent to get hold of you. And <laughs> our numbers were blocked. We're like, oh god, I got to <laughs> check the box. Never, never. But you had a Hall of Fame career. You're doing incredible stuff right now. I'm so proud of you i'm so happy for you and it's so great to see you again thank you for coming on the show no thank you both for having me i i i got back to you in 30 seconds and i was you like did, yes, right absolutely. Yeah. i was like absolutely yeah. no no yeah. questions asked whatever works for you guys um i i think very highly of the both of you and i'm very happy that uh i got to learn from the both of you i'm very happy that i got to share the ring with you john and what i'm most happy about is the friendship that i was able to establish with the both of you uh, you know, Ron also, and, uh, you know, and that'll last until the day we die. Uh, Bubba, I, uh, I reiterate what uh, John said, man, it's a pleasure when, when, when we, we were going through, you know, who, who, who can we get on? And he, Bubba, I said, do you think we get Bubba? Cause his show is so big now. I don't know if he'd have time for us. And he said, I'll call him. I said, good, great. And so he, 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 he put it out there about 20 seconds later, he called it, Bubba's in. I Man, you got some influence there, but man, I appreciate what you're doing, what you've done. Like I said before, it was a pleasure always to be your agent and work with you because you always come up with great ideas and great, great reasons why you're coming up with, with those suggestions. And it's always, and, and people don't understand the pressure that you go through, both as a talent and as a producer backstage, you know, because you're dealing with one boss and sometimes they'll like what you're doing. But you you knew the you knew the system, and you you're one of the most creative guys I work with, and one of the most helpful guys. So I thank you, and most of all, I thank you for giving us your time today. It's been a blast. We we like to come on here and tell old road stories, make people laugh, and just that's how John and I started this thing. We we're both doing our thing during the pandemic, and John called, hey, why don't we do this together? Let's tell some stories to make people laugh, feel good about themselves. Oh, there's so much negative uh, stuff out there. And you, you, you subscribe to that same philosophy. So keep it up, my friend. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Mr. Briscoe. I appreciate every word you said. Thank you very much.